My name is Josh Saul. I am a, a senior technical marketing engineer with Appstra. And now we're going to talk about how to perform fast and reliable rollbacks with your data center network. So today I'm going to show you how the combination of a graph model and a single source of truth can be used to manage the most complex automation processes. And we built AOS to scale to the largest, most complicated networks in the world. Every business and every network is different, right? As architects, we have this notion of our network being a snowflake. And you can imagine that as a vendor, every one of our customers is a snowflake. So what is routine for one customer might be incredibly complicated or even impossible for another. And this is due to the fact that some customers really excel at automation. And you know, maybe they have a small number of tools that are well coupled and workflows that everyone is following. But a design goal for AppStore was to create a tool that made our customers' most complex work really simple. And that's why we use the graph model to describe all the relationships and dependencies in our network. Now, if we leverage the single source of truth in the graph, which DJ has talked about, it frees us up from a lot of mundane tasks. We can guarantee that the tasks are completed successfully without typos or errors. Now, with a rich and modeled a rich and detailed model of the network, we can leverage these computer processes to automatically complete a number of common tasks in seconds rather than months or even years. Since these processes are, are pretty lightweight and require little compute power, we might as well take advantage of parallel processing and simply run all the computations all the time. And these tasks are, are outlined here and I would imagine that you can come up with a number of additional ones. So AOS is performing system checks on the graph to ensure consistency both of the network model and the performance of the network itself. And every time the user makes a change to the network, AOS will recompute all of the necessary additions or deletions, not just for the configuration, but also for the self-validation that we just touched on. So basically for everything that AOS can do to the network, it will expect something to happen. And these expectations are automatically created within the graph. So you can be sure when you create something like a new network, that AOS will verify that the network is up and reachable for all devices that should be able to reach it. There's a lot more to this validation, which DJ has already gone into a great amount of detail on. So this is what I was hinting at earlier. What operators really wanna do is select a running configuration or network state for the entire network, not for an individual device. And you know, spoiler alert, AOS does this in a really simple and cool way. It can store copies of the graph model so you can have a running version as well as a revision. But as operators, and it's mostly operators in the room, um, we like when tools do things by themselves. So AOS is gonna perform this action every single time you click the commit button in the UI. It'll store the last 25 commits and you can also manually mark the known good configurations as restore points. And here's the most important part again. It's doing this for you automatically for the entire network. You don't need to think about what happens on each device. It's treated as a single system. The feature is called Intent Time Voyager. It's available on the AOS server in the Time Voyager tab. And it only takes three clicks to perform massive changes with guaranteed completion and self-validation. So let's consider a, a very simple change, right? We wanna modify the host name on one of our switches. The host name is either determined by or used in some other process in the business. Otherwise, there'd be no need to change it, right? Maybe it's used by the monitoring system or you know, to resolve the host name to IP or to display the device name in a graph or visualization or just something simple like the, the interface descriptions. So right off the bat, we could probably agree that changing a host name is actually a two-part operation. You make the change, then you have to go and change all the dependent systems. So in reality, I think we all agree that there are no simple network changes when we consider all the things that actually have to happen. Now, what about something more complicated? Let's say you wanted to add a new tenant to our shared IP fabric. A tenant can have multiple isolated VRFs, each with their own collection of virtual networks or VNIs. The virtual networks are gonna span the entire fabric. And in addition to the VRF isolation between the routing domains, we also wanna leverage packet filters on the ingress of the virtual networks. Now that's where it gets really complicated. You need to create new VRFs, add IP addressing, BGP neighbors, some static routes for your next hop reachability. 
an egress routing policy, and the ACLs of the security team, as always, requires for each application deployment. Now, even before the ACLs, you're looking at hundreds of lines of config for each device. You might have thousands of devices in the fabric that have to get updated. Now, even if you could solve this with a very complex Ansible playbook, you still have to have the original problem to contend with. You have to update all the monitoring systems at the exact same time you're deploying these changes. And that is actually what AOS is designed to do. A common workflow looks something like this. We deploy the initial network at day one and everything looks good. Then we go a few months with some normal operational changes. And at some point, the executive team comes to us and tells us that they want to launch a new health mobile app on iOS. So we get ready to create a new tenant within the network. We create all the necessary virtual networks and ACLs and push the changes into the fabric. But at the last minute, the CEO has decided not to launch the app. We no longer need the new tenant that we just created. So we can simply roll back to the network revision just before we created the tenant. This restore but, process. Josh, still you are doing the configuration management, right? You are preparing all the configuration for the new tenant. Correct. Yes, we. Uh, yes, that's right. So what then? What's what would be the difference from the configuration management aspect from Ansible then? Ansible playbook, playbook tenant. When you make changes in an AOS system, you add new tenants and new and network services. AOS looks at the graph, the changes that you've made to the graph, and automatically figures out all of the operational um, analytics and telemetry that need to be gathered and presents them to you in a way in which you can comprehend them. Not so just included, but also operational state you are talking about. Okay. Ab absolutely, yeah. So these two things are effectively linked together. There's no change in an AOS system that doesn't incur some additional monitoring or validation, okay? And I would, and I would also add that uh, one difference is that with Ansible, you have to provide variables files, which contains all the parameters that need to be pushed. You provide them now, you could make a mistake in these variable files and you're gonna screw up your configuration. With AOS, these variable files or what we call device model is derived from the graph. So there is no uh, possibility to make a mistake. And then it's also when somebody goes and changes, somebody goes and changes ASN on leaf seven, the graph already reflects that and it's, I have to change my peering session because ASN has changed. That happens automatically. It's discovered. Yes. Well, you have supplied it through intent. You have asked to change ASN number through intent. This is now captured and it's saying, saying to all its neighbors, your neighbor has changed ASN numbers, adjust your configurations to reflect that. Thank you. Great. So the restore process can obviously be used if a change causes an actual network problem, which is you know, a possibility. And I like to call this uh, feature the oops or the oh shoot button, um, where some change had a less than desirable effect. And we wanna quickly undo it across the entire network. Now, one last thing about this workflow, the way OS handles revisions, it actually allows us to perform diffs between distant commits. So when we move to a revision, AOS creates an entirely new revision. Basically, this means that AOS can perform the differential on commits on separate branches, just to use a source control term, so you understand this, without having to go through a multi-branch compare process. So all revisions on the graph can be directly compared to each other with no additional branch comparison. And that's what makes a Time Voyager really flexible and extremely fast. By the way, Time Voyager was not there when I came uh, to headquarters of Abstra two years ago. Guys, uh, you are moving very fast. Uh, I'm almost becoming evangelist. So uh, yeah, I will change my title now. <laughs> All right, thank you. Well, let, well let's, let me show you and I'll get you even more excited. I'm gonna show you this demo now. So let's go ahead and uh, take this thing for a test drive. And um, in my demo, I'm gonna jump over to um, really the same topology that DJ was using before we talked about this Austin, Texas. And here is, the blueprint for this uh, data center or this uh, network within the data center. And I click on it and um, immediately, you know, I'm presented with the standard tabs that are at the top. And um, the important thing to me right now is to look at that uncommitted tab and just make sure that uncommitted is green. And that means that there are no changes that are queued up. There's no one that's doing any work. I don't have anything that I left over that I didn't push into the network. So I'd like to see that that's green. And then I'm gonna go into this time Voyager tab and within the Time Voyager tab, 
you know, we have this tabular view of all of the revisions or commits that have been pushed into the network. And there's a description next to them, right? So we have a way of describing what happened. And you can fill this with anything you want. It's free form text. So I have a description and a ticket number, and then, you know, a uh, perhaps the, the, the requester, I might put that in here. So, you know, we've got Orhan and, uh, um, you know, uh, Ben Story, John Herber, Jordan Martin, you know, really just the rock stars of the networking industry have, have requested changes to our network. So I've got that all categorized here. And then on the right-hand side, you can see when this change was um, stored in AOS. And here, this one by uh, Orhan is the most current version, okay? And then the username that, that performed the commit. And then to the right, I have these three buttons. And this is where, like, this is the simple button. So one is to jump to this revision, to queue up changes for this particular movement in time, either forward or backwards. And then I have the ability to keep the revision. And again, AOS will automatically store the last 25 revisions, but you can manually keep like your known good configurations just so they're never lost to time. And then after that, we have the ability to update the description. So if you had a typo or you wanna change what that description is, something was you know just a normal change and you have a ticket number in there, but then you say, wow, this, this thing worked really well. And this is like what I want my vanilla known good configuration. So you can update all that. And the buttons are really simple. There's not much to them. So if I wanted to go back to, um, you know, I want to go back to a point in time to um, launch this particular uh, app that we had talked about, this new app that the CEO was asking about. I click on jump to this revision and I get a, a modal confirmation that says, do you actually want to roll back? And actually AOS isn't doing anything with that modal except pre-positioning all those changes in uncommitted. So now I can go into the uncommitted tab and it will turn yellow in a couple yeah, of seconds. I, I, uh, I, I loaded that one up, so that's ready to go. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, so DJ sort of moved forward without me. And let's go ahead and... Um, uh, well, Orhan did to be specific. Oh, Orhan did, sorry. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and roll back to um, a different revision. Thanks for that, DJ. To work on the fly a little bit. And you can see now that my changes have um, been queued up and uncommitted. So AOS performed this differential between where I'm at in time right now, the present, and the past. And what we're doing is we're saying, you know, the CEO changed his mind at the last minute and wants to remove, you know, so we don't want all this extra garbage in our network. Um, so we're going to remove it. And this single change is represented as all these little things that we've done. So if we had created a, um, you know, this is an iOS app. So we have an Apple health security policy, our SecOps policy dictated to us by our, our peer team. We also have our SLAs for this tenant. So we defined some characteristics we want for the network that our AOS will adhere to. And those are part of this change. We also have the security zone, which you can equate with a VRF. You know, that's a, a tenant, a routing domain, which we called Apple health. And then attached to that VRF are these five virtual networks or VNIs, which are backed by EVPN and VXLAN. And all of these can be introspected now that we're you know, about to make this change. We can look at one of the virtual networks. So Apple Health One is on VNI um, 20,014 with an IPv4 subnet, a route target or RTI, uh, uh, RT is listed there. What devices are actually connected or plumbed into this, this VNI, their VLAN mapping, um, a topology view, if there are any changes to topology, and so on. And we could potentially make changes to this before we pushes in, but I'm gonna just go ahead and accept all these changes. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click on this commit button. And now this is what I, I hinted at before that we're creating a new revision in time. So I say, uh, CEO decided not to deploy the app, period. Maybe there's a ticket number, whatever. So I click on commit and now AOS is pushing all of these changes as well as the expectations and the new telemetry that needs to be gathered to ensure that all of that is gonna work. Now removing stuff actually just removes a lot of telemetry, but you can imagine that there's all sorts of things that you maybe don't think about like you know, on day one, like, well, when you remove this, maybe I should have gone back and changed interface names. Maybe I should have changed, you know, who knows? But AOS knows because it's going back to the graph. And from the graph, there are processes that derive configurations derive expectations and derive 
the needed telemetry to validate that the system is whole, the system is consistent. And it just did that in a split second. Okay, so all the changes are now out in the network and I can go back into the dashboard and look at how things are performing. But really let's go to the, back to the time Voyager and you can see that now I have a new commit that says CEO decided not to deploy the app and it's the current and I have these three buttons over here. So I can do whatever I want with, with this particular version of the network. So again, this is designed to be really simple. There's not a lot to it, but if you imagine what's actually happening, it's incredibly complex. And this is not the type of stuff that I wanna be doing day in and day out. This is the type of stuff that we wanna to offload to a computer or to a process because it does it without typos and it does it really, really fast. And it just makes everyone's lives much simpler. So sort of just in to, to recap what we just did here, everything that you do in an AOS system is stored in this graph model, okay? And we have processes that derive both the configuration as well as the expectations from that graph and it's nearly instantaneous. And then every time you push the commit button, AOS will create a snapshot of the network. And that is the entire network, that entire blueprint, not each individual device. And then we can move from one revision to another. And this is across multiple vendors. So AOS will do this. If you have a, a Cisco network that has a couple Juniper devices, the configurations, all the rendering and the expectations and the telemetry and the show commands, it's all handled automatically by AOS. There is nothing that you have to do in order to make that function. And Orhan, to follow up a uh, comment about service assurance. So for example, here, you know, you may be moving to a, con to a state, you know, two weeks ago. And again, we are not just taking snapshots of configuration and pushing them. We keep the whole intent. We actually don't even store this configuration. We derive them from the intent. But imagine that your SLAs may have changed. Your service assurance thresholds may have changed between two weeks and now. Uh, again, with, with AOS, you get this one click button, which takes you there, readjust SLAs expectations so that, you know, right expectations are being set again, and you don't have to reconfigure your service insurance and telemetry collection and all of that stuff. It is the fastest, well, this is my honest opinion, and nobody pays me the money for this, I'm telling you. Uh, it is the fastest probably growing uh, IBM, I mean, not monetary wise, adding the future, adding the capability uh, company, which definitely everybody should follow upstream. This is my opinion. Thanks, Oran. Thank and just to provide context, remember how excited we were when Jonas introduced rollback. I mean, it was the biggest deal in networking. It took Cisco for years to introduce it in ISXR. <laughs> it was for single device. We are doing it for the whole network, independently of size, complexity of features, number of tenants. So just think about it. So this is all really cool. The question for you, when I'm buying Appstra, what am I actually buying? Where is AOS actually running? Well, AOS is distributed as a, a virtual machine. So you run the virtual machine on-prem, but the virtual machine can actually sit anywhere. It doesn't have strict latency requirements. And that virtual machine, it's pretty lightweight virtual machines, like you know, um, 64 gigs of RAM and eight, gig, eight, eight virtual CPUs. So it's not some huge you know, like monstrosity of a, of a system. And it can manage ver uh, many networks. So it's not just one blueprint. You can have a whole bunch of blueprints managed by one AOS system. Um, I think that that answered your question. And how is it actually communicating? What's, what's it doing? Talk oh, so it has a bi-directional optimized communication protocol to the agents. And the agents can either be installed on the box or can actually act in a proxy mode where the agents are spun up at the same process is spun up as a um, inside of a container on the AOS server. So you have a, two different deployment options, but um, it communicates to the device, you know, via the normal standard vendor recommended protocols and methods. So for Cisco, that might be NX, you know, API. For Cumulus, it's SSH managing some files in the Linux file system, restarting services. It, it depends on each vendor. My question, a uh, little bit more technical, maybe your roadmap if you don't want to answer. So um, EVPN, of course, it has been uh, around for on the upstream platform. I have been following. Is an underlay uh, many routing protocols uh, supported as well. Now, in the especially massively scale data center space, we are seeing new uh, routing protocol. This routing protocol, Jeff, 
uh, we did a lot of actually session with Jeff, like uh, with Tony P uh, on Rift and uh, with the chair also uh, on GB plus SPF. When we seen RFC for them, uh, would we see the support on the Abstra for those protocols as well? Let me answer this. Please, Jeff. Uh, we are customer driven and uh, our market is enterprise. Size wise, they're they're just migrating from EIGRP to BGP, right? So okay. thinking yeah. about next gen routing protocols, something probably for the next five years. Yeah. So if we have customer and proper cases to develop it, nothing would prevent it. Again, the configurational part and expectations are generated from the data modeling. So data model is exactly the same. It just protocol is different. So mm -hmm. it's not very difficult for us to do. It just, we are following our customers. So Definitely, I got your point. Then uh, it seems that EVPN, uh, you are seeing more and more those uh, I see a lot of enhancements on that. Okay. Yeah, and again, I, I expect EVPN to stay there for a long time. We see support of EVPN for Geneva. We see people like VMware implementing EVPN directly from tier zero routers. So there's a lot of stuff that's coming up and we are working on all of it or most of it to support, to help our customers. So stay tuned. So what about, um, uh, would you position Abstra for the data center or um, data center interconnect or would it be useful also for the wider networks and even in the local area network campuses? So uh, what do you think about it? Well, let me take this one. So uh, we talk about this in different presentation, but uh, AOS has two pieces. There is a platform piece and then there is a reference design piece. So think of it as a reference design being the cartridge that you slot into console and then you play a video game. So right now we have this one reference design cartridge, which is data center, data center interconnect. Uh, but all of these fundamental mechanisms that we shared with you today, which is about the rollback, about uh, real-time updates, about graph support, that is independent of the reference design. So you can imagine, you know, you us having a, our own team, once we are bigger than a startup, we are now building a reference design for completely different domains. But all the benefits of context and real-time and reliability are going to be, be there. So it's a matter of coming up with a new network reference design. Everything so that, underneath that is network protocol uh, agnostic. So at the moment, uh, enterprise driven, we are seeing, but when it comes to, let's say, service provider space, segment routing or uh, many other technologies, we would also see. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and I would say enterprise, we see the boundaries blurring up, right? So you think mm -hmm. the cloud, it looks exactly the same way. It's mostly VPN VXLAN. You think service provider data center, Again, mostly EVP and VXLAN. So while our original market focus has been enterprise, we see more and more, especially in Delta cases, they do exactly the same things. So very- I know service provider data center even running the EI jack. <laughs> you could see anything you like. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks. All right, we're, um, we're getting prodded to move on to the next section. So I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. Josh, are you presenting the next section? Yes, I am. Will you do me a favor and reintroduce yourself? I will. And I will. just as a yeah. reminder, you have 30 minutes left. Okay. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do this quickly. Let me win. Go for it. Okay. My name is Josh Saul. I'm a senior technical marketing engineer with Abstra. And now I'm gonna give you a quick demonstration of how to visualize traffic trends for optimal network performance. So network operators are always trying to better understand how traffic is actually flowing through the network. With virtual networks and virtual machines, we know that traffic flows can be hard to identify or locate. And an application that consumes a large amount of network bandwidth might be in one area of the network one day and a totally different area of the network the next. So we wanted to give AOS users the ability to overlay traffic statistics on the network diagram itself with nice indicators and call out inter interfaces that may be reaching a point of saturation. So this is all visual. Obviously, let's just jump straight into the demonstration. I'm gonna use a different topology for this. I'm gonna use something that is uh, much, much bigger. So um, I have this blueprint uh, Newtstorp, which sounds to me like um, an Ikea um, product. And um, I'm gonna jump right in and, and take a look at the, um, the dashboard here. 
But really what I want to do is I want to go straight to this, this active view. Okay. And the active view is the topology of the network that is overlaid with um, relevant information. So here is my topology and I can show the links if you want to see that, that sort of stuff. But this functionality is actually revealed through a, you know, we have the ability to layer on information. And what I want to layer on is what we call traffic heat. So this is real time information that's in that data store that is related to all these devices. And it is presented to me in a visual color coded format. So you can see that there is a, a legend up here on the upper right hand side, zero to 20%, 21 to 40% and so on. So from green to amber, this shows how much a particular device or interface is loaded. And it's percent based. So I don't actually have to code it for, you know, four gigs of a 40 gig interface. AOS can obviously tell the difference between a 40 gig interface, a 10 gig interface, a 100 gig interface. And I just want to look at percentages. I just want to know how loaded some of these devices are. And um, everything in AOS in, in the user interface you can drill into. Uh, first, let me just show you that the, in addition to the color coordination, um, we have these indicators for anomalies. So I have you know, some high water mark, and I want to know if I'm above the high water mark for a certain amount of time. And that's what these little red um, exclamation points are. But let's drill into a device. Let's look at spine one. And you can see that spine one has a certain number of, of interfaces connected to all the leaf switches. Let's jump back to the, um, the, the leaf view for one second. And um, let's go to a leaf and look at how the servers are connected. So you can see how much traffic is on any particular server link at any point in time. And in fact, if you hover over them, if, whoops, sorry, clicked on the wrong thing. If you hover over these interfaces, you get real time view of essentially the show interface command, right? It's not just transmit and receive, it's your unicast, broadcast, multicast, FCS errors, framing errors, CRC errors, runs, all that stuff is presented here. So what a standard, you know, what a, a network operator would be looking at is all presented. And this is in real time. So this is gonna get updated, you know, every, every 15 seconds. Uh, based on you know you just sort of watching it, and what's important to to show you here is that I can trace out the path. I can look at okay from this particular server, I want a headroom view. I want to look at from this server to another server on the other side of the fabric. So let's pick a neighbor somewhere else on the fabric, and I'll scroll down to this one. And now AOS, based on the graph model in real time, builds out the entire um, clause fabric right with all of the ECMP paths. So right now I only have two spines, but imagine if I had eight spines and like, you know, 50 leaves, this diagram would look pretty substantial and pretty interesting. And the interfaces are, again, color coded and are showing how much traffic is going through them. So I can immediately drill into what's hot in my network and identify things like, you know, a, a server that's doing a backup while the application is still running. Now this is really important because operators, you know, probably 10, 15 times a week, you're asked by the server team, well, server A to server B, there's some sort of communication issue. I, like tr the, the network is down, right? As, as far as they're concerned. And you can quickly determine why is that person saying that packets can't get through the network. I've already validated that the L3 fabric is up, my L2 services are up and so on, but maybe I have too much contention for some of these links. And here it's all presented visually. So really quickly, you can say from server A to server B, show me all available paths. And this is based on intent. So if I add a new switch, if I add a new um, spine, immediately that will appear in the diagram. If I put a device into a drain state or into maintenance mode, it's immediately removed because AOS knows that this device is no longer forwarding. It's no, no longer part of the routing domain. So again, this is really tied back to intent. These graph, these models are built based on that initial um, graph design and all the, the subsequent changes. So in addition to viewing this in real time, we also have a time series view. So someone says to you, well, at this particular time slice every single day, um, the application fails. So I wanna go and change it to time series. And now I get the same view on the bottom, but I can select my time slice on the top. So here I'm collecting all of this data over 30 days and I can pick which day I want. So I can just dial in it into a particular day and let's go here and then I say, well, which hour do I want to look at? And then with this toggle, I can go back in time and say, okay, on this particular point in time, the network was doing this from point A to point B. And this is just like, you know, if you want to figure out exactly 
where the bottlenecks are, um, given the you know fully redundant and um, equal cost you know multipathing that we have in our networks, becomes really challenging. You have to go to every single device and do show interface and and you know BGP neighbor and make sure they were up and and all that. This is all done automatically on the fly in real time with AOS. And again, now we have this time series functionality and the visual overlays that allow you to, to see it. So just to like recap that functionality, um, the telemetry views are created from intent. So you don't have to do anything, they're always there. And the traffic statistics are always, um, you know, they're always being gathered by devices, regardless of which vendor or which show interface command or what sort of, you know, uh, command you have to run in order to get that. The traffic is um, normalized. The units are all exactly the same, even though some vendors use, you know, still um, kilobits per second and others are using gigabits. Um, the, you know, we can put that traffic onto any of the network views that we have. And, and you know that there are a lot of views that I haven't shown you and that that same heat layer can be applied to any of those views. And again, we can apply this to, from any node to any other node in the system. So we also have the ability to track where VMs are located and you could very easily say, I wanna know from this virtual machine on this virtual overlay across my network, what are the available paths and how much traffic is being eaten up on the physical network. Now that's really powerful. That's visibility of the virtual machines and all of the traffic overlaid at the same time. So I think this so feature that, is really cool. I get pretty excited about it. Sorry, there's a question. In, in that, uh, that real time view, um, you were saying that was polling every 15 seconds? Yeah, actually on this view, uh, the, the U, well, it's Just when you get down to the end-to-end -end view, I assume, not like the whole network every 15 seconds. Uh, actually, so um, the, the traffic is coming off of the devices every 10 seconds. Um, the user interface is, is refreshing the UI, the web browser, every 30 seconds. You can actually dial that down. But no, we are gathering the traffic on every single interface every 10 seconds. Good grief. Yeah, does that sound so, like pretty crazy? It, yes, that it, does sound pretty crazy. It, 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 take, it took a lot of engineering to get this to scale to hundreds and thousands of network devices. But indeed, we have some of the largest data centers in the world under AOS control, and they are running this without a problem. Wow, okay. Well, and we, are, we are following our vendors who we work with closely to do the right thing. Streaming telemetry is coming, when it's implemented by everybody and properly, we might move to more real-time data and more optimized. As of now, show counter, show interfaces is a common and most optimized way. And just one more point. Uh, George said that this is intent-driven and part of the intent is your choice of where do you want to collect this data from. So you can say collect it from the whole network or you can use a query and say, well, connect it from, you know, only leaves in data center west because that's what I care about right now. So there is a way for you to choose the subset of telemetry to be collected. So it's not like all of it all the time if you don't want it. Yeah, I mean, historically devices have been so, you know, so poorly written that uh, trying to get stats every 10 seconds has been a nightmare for them. But, uh, you know, it's been getting better over time as the CPUs well, have got better and, yeah. And yeah, I, the streaming te telemetry is where I'd like stuff to get to. Yes. So we're not reliant on SLA and things correct. like that. So, uh, things still a uh, little bit scary. Tens of thousands of devices every 10 seconds, a little bit scary. Mm. So, and yeah, and just, also that many TCP sessions, if you're actually doing it, you know, we're actually getting open open TCP sessions well, is fun too. So. Yeah, so just keep in mind that yeah. a lot of this is actually made possible by the agent. Right, so when you have the on-box agent, the agent can sit there and can check all these interfaces. It's sitting right on top of the box. It can check in real time. And it only really needs to send the differentials back to the AOS server. If there's no change, it says no change, no change, no change. And it's an optimized binary protocol from the agent back to the server. So it's not like we actually need to create these TCP sessions in order to gather the information from every device every 10 seconds. We do have to do that for some of the off-box design scenarios, but with the on-box agent, it's speedy, it's, it's, it's fast. And only differentiate data. So uh, will be, I, I assume, will be very small amount of data. So bandwidth point of view also will not be a problem. Yes. That's right. And, and just with checking things, things to check for telemetry, um, the, the, the local agent actually knows what it's looking for. So it doesn't have to like 
like send it back to the AOS server to parse things. It says, I have five BGP neighbors. These are the ASNs. These are the IP addresses. No change, no change, no change versus saying show IP BGP sum and just streaming that back and forth. Yeah, obviously that's going to put a lot of traffic on the network. So we don't want to do that. We have this optimized method for doing it with the agents. Okay, yeah, I'm getting the uh, cattle prod now. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to DJ for the next session. All right, thank you very much, Josh. If you'll go ahead and unshare your screen, DJ will get his back up. We're in the home stretch here, folks. So um, if you have any questions, make sure you tweet them out. Um, this has been a pretty good session. One might even say it was uh, supersonic with the amount of information that we're, uh, we're learning. And yeah, that pun was totally intended. So, DJ, are you ready to go? I, I Well, you stole my dad jokes. I don't know where to begin, man. But yes, I, I am the ready. king of dad jokes in field day. <laughs> All right, take it away, sir. All right. Uh, hi, I'm DJ Spry, Director of Customer Engineering at Appstra. Uh, today, I'd like to talk to you a bit about how Appstra manages an automated enterprise SOC uh, and really discuss a bit about uh, what actually is an enterprise SOC. And so, um, just real quick, <clears throat> jumping into it to make up some time. Uh, I just want to cover, we're going to cover the high level architecture of Sonic and what the differences is between enterprise Sonic and Sonic and how you interface with it. Um, and how Appstra and AOS allows you to evaluate and operationalize Enterprise Sonic in the data center. And it's uh, by this time, if, uh, for those of you who have watched previous sessions, we'll see that the normalization and everything else that we've seen uh, is a large part of how we're doing this. But uh, to move forward pretty quickly, um, just a quick recap for maybe those of you not familiar with Sonic uh, or what Enterprise Sonic distribution is, is that uh, it was originally developed by Microsoft to operate uh, the networking in their Azure cloud platform. And in 2016, Microsoft donated Sonic to the Open Compute Project or OCP. Um, so it's a completely open source offering. And we at Appster have been involved with OCP and even Sonic uh, at the very beginning. <clears throat> and we presented several OCP summits if you're interested in go check those out on YouTube. But uh, in May of this year, Dell Technologies announced an enterprise Sonic distribution that was based on its open source counterpart. Um, and this enterprise Sonic distribution includes a feature enhancements that's targeted to enterprise data centers and specifically spine and leaf network topologies and the features they need versus say the slim features that one would use in Azure cloud. And what we're talking about are features like MLAG, uh, eVPN, VXLAN, SNMP, and even a common CLI. So, you know, those are not really part of the cloud OS offering. Um, but I would wager that the, you know, the people uh, watching this and, and that are, um, for your deployments, that they are probably needed. Um, and so at the same time, we decided to partner um, to bring together the AppStra's engineering expertise with around the open source community, uh, with OCP specifically and our intent-based networking software and features and coupled with the supply chain and global reach of of Dell. Um, and in addition to that, for the customers who uh, wanted an alternative option or vendor diversity, um, we also offer the same um, uh, distribution of enterprise Sonic uh, for those customers who may want to use Edge Core. And so at this point in time, um, you know, you have a full featured uh, you know, distribution and uh, with global support, it's real alternatives to an incumbent. And so at this point in time, it's like, great, yet another open source operating system or something that's different, but like, why is it actually better? <clears throat> the first off, it's, uh, it's built on a very modern architecture and it's, uh, it's very modular. Um, there's lots of uses of containers that we're gonna see. Um, it leverages other open source uh, capabilities such as Psy, the switch abstraction interface, and that allows you to run the same operating system um, across multiple different vendors and multiple different ASICs. Um, and uh, so for instance, you see there that, that PSI layer, um, which is the API translation between the operating system above it and the, the ASIC below it. Um, and when I mentioned containers this, this week in a lot of the social circles and Twitters and et cetera, there was conversations about um, how much container networking um, one would need if you're a networking engineer. And uh, with Sonic, you're getting some containers. Um, so <laughs> there are multiple modules, multiple containers that interact with each other. So for instance, you can see one there for FRR and you can see one for, you know, for various other ones. So it's very modular. So you, you can upgrade and enhance each one. Um, and uh, there's a centralized infrastructure, but part of this is even the routing domain or even the routing piece. So we're, by default, it's FRR, free range routing, which is also another piece of open source operating systems, uh, or I'm sorry, an open piece of software. Um, and then there is this uh, 
infrastructure that relies on this read database engine, which Shocker is also a container. And so at a super one-on-one -on -one level, like Redis is the key value like database that provides the language independent interface and a method for persistency and replication and processing communications of like the whole subsystem. So you can look at, at this as, as like the heart of Sonic, um, even though it is highly modular and containerized. And so, you know, at this point in time, uh, if, if uh, comics have told us anything, is that with great power comes great responsibility. So now that you have this open source NOS with multiple distribution um, mechanisms um, that is highly modular, built on microservices, runs across many networks, like what's the catch? And really the, the, it is understanding and learning how to configure and interface and interact with Sonic, how you automate it, um, what are the bits and pieces that you need to of the uh, syntax to, to um, perform you know, changes in the network, incremental changes in the network and minimize and avoid disruption because that's definitely a deal breaker. Um, and moving along quickly, there's several different pieces of uh, parts of Sonic that you can configure the uh, this operating system. So there's a number of CLIs and JSON interfaces and flat, flat files and uh, and et cetera. Uh, the, Dell inter the, the enterprise Sonic distribution includes a what they call a management framework, which centralizes uh, a lot of the configuration behind a common CLI. And it's a, an interactive CLI, very industry standards looking CLI. Um, but what it is, is a wrapper around NetConf. Um, and so again, we're back to, we have, uh, you know, we have some flat files, we have some uh, configuration that's a wrapper around NetConf, which is very device level, you know, independently device level and not at a service level. And so, you know, if you just pause for a second and take a mental exercise, like how would you back this device up, right? Or if you refer back to the uh, earlier presentation Josh did in, in Time Voyager, like how would you roll back to a specific point in time across your entire data center when you have this many uh, items? Um, and some of which are disruptive, uh, which I'll talk about in the demo. So when you look at things like inter incremental change to the VLAN, uh, it's something quite basic that we do all the time, you have to then begin to answer certain questions like, okay, does this have an IP address in the trunk of the URF? Okay, do I touch this file or that file or do I use RESCOMP and et cetera? Um, and so unlike Spider-Man, we don't have like superpowers. So it's, it's a lot of work. And this is whole layer of like interdependencies of like constraints that are not magically solved by any one person or any library or any math, you know, automation framework. Um, it's, uh, it's hard work. And uh, at Appster and at AOS, we've done the homework and arduous amounts of coding and testing, trialing and errors and working with the community. And to that end, we have internally we run at last count about 600 topologies internally. And uh, we run thousands of devices every day from multiple vendors uh, across numerous operating systems, switch operating systems, chipsets, virtual devices, physical devices, 5,000 devices. And of that, we perform at every branch and every merge that we have um, 10,000 line, 10,000 tests per commit every time we do this. So at the end, we're talking about 15 million tests per day. And so, um, it's a, an Im immense amount of work and testing that we put into this. And I'm not saying by any means that Appstra has, you know, like solved this problem and holistically, but, um, you know, we are far in front of the lead. Uh, we have the correct framework and, and talent, et cetera. And so with AOS, you get the interoperability, the pre-validations, the normalizations, the visibility, uh, the maintenance workflows, everything that we that you see as part of Abstra and AOS is a part of it's like quote unquote a data sheet. So things like uh, intent based analytics or data center interconnect or um, you know maintenance workflows, you get all of that with Enterprise Sonic. Um, so now you actually have uh, a way of choice and control your network, you know, to adopt this you know more open, more cost effective solution if you desire, or you could deploy you know homogeneous uh, Sonic if you wanted. Uh, and with that, I can yeah get a look at what this actually looks like under the hood, um, and uh, and start a demo here. Maybe, maybe. Okay. So um, what I did is I took advantage of we have a coat low site um, that we use uh, internally for a lot of this testing, and you can see here I took advantage of this. Uh, we were expanding in a in a core site colo facility, um, and. 
we have a, a five node network and as part of this five node network here, um, a rack of this, which I wanna highlight on. Um, it, this is all Sonic with a few exceptions, which I'll show here. <clears throat> and um, in this topology, you can see we have lots of servers. We call these build servers. And um, what I can see here is that, you know, I, if I look, you can see that there's a serial number associated with this device and it's an active device and it's running um, Sonic, uh, specifically this build called Buzzin Plus. Um, and if you look at the rendered configuration here, what you're going to see is what we consider or what's best to be considered of the startup config. So this is config.db.json. And this is startup config because uh, if you write to this device, the device reloads um, or the routing information reloads, but this is the, the non-routing piece. So if I look here, I can see that I have VRF dev uh, and inside of this VRF dev, inside of this, uh, this JSON spec, you can see um, there's a fair number of interfaces, but then there's also this config FRR. Um, Appstra contributed a piece of code um, and upstreamed it, which was accepted by Microsoft that allows a mode for which we can write the routing instruction set directly to FRR and allow FRR to do the diffs. And the combination of really what that means is that you can make changes to the network, um, any sort of dynamic changes to the network, uh, and it doesn't impact your routing command. But if you look at alternatively other Linux-based operating systems, if you were writing to a flight, if here, if you write to that flat file, it's going to cause an impact. So what I want to do also is, is show this, this other device in our, in our colo <clears throat> that's running EOS. And you can see here the serial number um, and, and the version that it's running uh, with this 7280. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to show how quickly it is that we can um, change this device, delete a bunch of VLANs, delete, delete a bunch of security zones, and, and show the difference. But what I want to show is here's the, the running. Again, because we have the source of truth, um, this is the running. The documentation is always up to date. So I can see I have those same VRFs uh, extended to this device. Um, uh, again, the VRF dev, and just for brevity, I don't want to show all of that. But, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, what I want to do is uh, make some changes in this uh, topology and start deleting some things and kind of highlight the differences between startup configuration and uh, configuration that is done incrementally. And so here you can see we have this, we have this what's called a runner and in this runner VLAN that's associated with, uh, in this case, every device in, the, in my colo. And I'm going to uh, make some modifications here. I'm going to select all of these and just unassign them. So this is, uh, again, two different operating systems across uh, a, a number of different devices and interfaces. And I'm just going to make some changes and say, you know what, I don't want them on all of these devices. So it's a delete or a modification, depending. And then I want to add it as a VLAN tagged interface on some, you know, just random interfaces that I pick that, that really know here. And um, in addition to this, what I want to do is not only make a change for something that exists, but I'm going to go ahead and create a new virtual network. And in this case, I'm going to create a VLAN, VXLAN back network for NFD. And so the user interface here is exactly the same, right? The composition of what that configuration looks like and the expectations is handled by AOS. So I'm going to go ahead and create this in that dev, give it an IP address, treating it like, a, like a cattle, letting the IP resources sign itself automatically. And uh, I'm just going to sign it everywhere. I'm just going to be quite heavy handed um, because I'm lazy <clears throat> for no other reason, really. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm also going to go ahead and uh, take this number field day um, and delete something else, right? So I'm going to delete all this. We call it a build server. So I'm going to delete a VRF build server. I'm showing this because this is all through one you know, atomic action that's happening um, with both adding, deleting, changing. And if I go back to that original Sonic device and I look at my rendered config, you can see this config.dbjson, this startup config. For incremental changes, what we're doing is using RESConf. And this is where things get really interesting is that um, to automate this in a, in a, in a way that, uh, that is both uh, Productive for operations and doesn't incur downtime, you can see these RESCONF uh, calls and you can see the difference between puts and incremental and et cetera. But you know, a little more entertaining if we go down and I, you know, I find a, a trunk interface here, you can see this, this put command for VLAN 7. 
But because of to heart to call back to what Sasha said is that we don't store configuration. We render the configuration based on the intent. And we understand what the beginning is and what the end needs to be. And then we do that correct ordering. So here, if I look at a trunk interface, um, you know, for this specific device, it has like an MLAG, right? So now we're seeing uh, open source operating system running MLAG, but I don't have to be concerned with what the nuances of that or the order of operations in order to make this uh, work in a, in a non-disruptive manner. And so AOS does that. And if I scroll down a little bit further, um, you can see the routing of FRR. So again, here we do the FRR configuration um, and uh, that. So um, just in the interest of time, because there's a bit of a video here. Uh, if I step forward um, and I look at this device uh, that I used for the Arista, in the interest of time, what I want to do here is, is I don't really want to use this Arista in our colo. Uh, we want to use... Um, uh, Sonic. And in this case, we're going to Dell and use a Dell Sonic device. So in just a single click, if I go and swap that device out, this Sonic operating system, or I'm sorry, this Arista for a Sonic operating system. And now look, you can see in an instant, like that quickly, that everything is now rendered to start up and everything is now rendered based on that day zero configuration with that day zero intent. And all I have to do now is push commit, just as we've shown in previous, it's version control, you can branch it. Uh, and all of the analytics, telemetry, and everything so it's the same. I can look and see that there's no warnings, uh, and and that is showing, you know, like how what Sonic is, kind of what it looks like underneath the hood. Um, so just as a summary, uh, out of the interest of time, um, and maybe say a few minutes for questions. Is it, you know, it, it, Sonic is really exciting for the industry, really because you know it's a, it's really the first real open source, um, I would say, initiative that we've had. Uh, and now there is a way for our users to, you know, to onboard and allow you to evaluate and operationalize these in the data center without being completely disruptive. And as a transitional period, you can say, okay, I've got this incumbent vendor and I want to look at possibly doing this. I can just do one rack, right? Much like they do with applications, maybe just a portion of the data center uh, and try this out without actually, you know, completely disrupting your operational model. Um, and so with that, uh, I believe I am done. I apologize if that was quick, but is there any questions? Doesn't sound like there's any. Zach, did you want to do a quick wrap up before we get to the end of the session? No, I, yeah, I think I will real quick. Uh, let me see if I can share um, this quickly, quickly. Really what I just want to say is I, I heard a few comments about the evolution of Absure from some, several of you that have been with us from inception or last several years, and it's really a big compliment to us. And this is really why we do what we do. And your customers, people like yourselves, I think you've seen us and, and what we're able to do. We listen to our customers, we listen to your feedback, and uh, those comments were, were great. They were near and dear to my heart, so I, I appreciate that. So thank you, guys. I think what you've seen today, you know, initially I said reliability, right? We talked about that, removing the complexity. Uh, introducing that reliability and simplicity. Hopefully you saw all of that. I believe we demonstrated that today and we demonstrated that through Aptra's unique approach. We demonstrated that, you know, through the, you know, full automation and, uh, and validation. So <clears throat> that was the main thing. I mean, everything that we deliver is on this screen, but again, I go back to just remember everything that you see was built by architects and operators for architects and operators. Uh, we're here for you guys and we're here for our customers. And I just want to end it by saying, thank you for attending the session. Uh, any questions, please jump into the other room and, and we'll continue the conversation. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, DJ and Josh and uh, all the other folks from Abstra who uh, chimed in. I heard Jeff. I heard uh, Sasha. It's always great to have the whole Abstra team here presenting uh, lots of great information. I'm sure a lot of folks are going to be uh, watching the videos back on this one to, uh, to kind of learn a little bit more about things like Sonic and, uh, and Config Rollback. Uh, we're going to go ahead and call it a day here. Uh, we have some very um, full brains in the room. Uh, we're going to do a little Q&A uh, over in our little lobby area, but we are going to be back tomorrow morning for the final day of Networking Field Day 23, starting at 8 a.m. Pacific time. If you want to see who the lineup is, head over to our website, techfieldday.com. Click on the link for Networking Field Day. Uh, we got a, a good lineup of presenters there. 
Um, but for now, for tonight, we're, uh, we're going to eat some dinner, maybe have a drink or two and continue some great conversations. So we will see you bright and early in the morning. Prime Image, will you please bring down the stream?